So last month, Sue and I met our Korean couple friends for the first time face to face in person since Thanksgiving last year. It's been almost six months we haven't seen each other. So we met at Monday Park in Coquitlam on Saturday afternoon for a walk around the park. Now, we were so glad to see them finally in person after like forever. So without even thinking, we just shook hands and hugged each other like we always did. And then I realized that we are not supposed to do that. So I said, oops, but it was too late. We already touched and hugged each other, already committed a huge crime, already gone beyond the point of no return. So quickly, we put our face masks on and stepped back from each other six feet apart, and no touching from then on. Gosh, how did we forget? What if somebody had seen us doing that? What if somebody reported us to the police? That was close. Anyway, we had a great time that day. I think I mentioned this some time ago, folks. When asked, what would be the first thing people would do when the COVID lockdown is over and it's okay to gather in person, most people said that they would hug their loved ones whom they haven't seen each other and met since the lockdown started. To hug their friends and family members and grandparents in senior homes and church friends hugging and touching. And this is what all of us yearn right now, yearning to touch, yearning to hug our long absent loved ones, yearning to embrace and shake our friends' hands because it's been too long, because we need it soon for our well-being, because there's something special about getting physical, getting physical. You see, our physical touch is the most universal and personal way how we humans bond each other, how we greet each other with our friends, how the loving couples know each other most intimately, and how the babies and mother bond most deeply, starting from mother's womb and throughout the first few years after the birth. We all know how important the constant hugging and touching between babies and mothers are for the well-being of both of them, especially for the babies. I heard that many children who grew up in orphanages tend to lack certain emotional maturity because of a lack of intimate physical touch from their parents or loving guardians. Now, when I met Sue for the first time, like a long time ago, I took her to my hometown in Korea. And we had a chance to visit an orphanage that one of my relatives ran there. Now, I still remember that visit. See, there were a lot of kids, a lot of kids. And as we went in and sat on the bench, immediately two kids, about four and six years old, sat right beside each one of us and very close and tightly and holding our arms tight and wouldn't let go. And they wanted us to hold and hug them. So we hugged them and embraced them. And they wouldn't leave us, sat close to us until we left that place. I don't know, maybe it was their way of telling us, adopt us and take us. We almost did. I tell you folks, we had a great difficulty saying goodbye to them later. They yearn for that physical touch. We all yearn for touch, physical touch. Our physical touch is a constant reminder that we are not alone, that we belong, that we are loved. See, even our animal companions like dogs and cats and even other wild animals need, yearn, need and yearn for physical touches. Monkeys groom each other all the time. Lions rub their bodies with the others in their pack. The elephants touch the young ones with their long, huge nose. The physical touch is the most universal and personal way of knowing each other. A constant reminder that we belong, that we are loved. It's how we bond together as one. But this COVID lockdown has deprived us of this essential way of bonding. Deprived us of this, our primary and most intimate need for our health and well-being. You see, I don't mind seeing people virtually 
on Zoom, I don't mind this virtual touch once in a while, but I really need physical contact. As I said before, I'm not a touch and feely type of person. I want people to leave me alone, not touching me most of the times, but once in a while, I also need physical contact with my loved ones, seeing my friends and church people face to face, shaking hands or even hugging each other, and I don't mind, I don't mind. Some people have said that these virtual meetings are the thing of the future, that we don't need a workplace to go to, we don't need office space for people to gather, that all we all need, what we all need is this virtual room, this virtual Zoom. This way we will get things done more quickly and effectively, we will save time and cost, it's convenient, with increased productivity, and also will be less environmentally harmful because we drive less, right? I get that. Yes, I get that. But after almost one year of constant virtual meetings, I'm getting this virtual space disorientation. I'm getting this Zoom meeting burnout. I'm getting tired of virtual high five, virtual coffee time, virtual birthday wishes, virtual funerals and weddings, virtual board and committee meetings, virtual worship services. Well, but we, we're going to continue on that. And this virtual goodbyes, I'm, I'm getting tired of all this. You see, I didn't sign up for virtual world when I was born. I want the real world, the real human touch. If this lockdown goes any longer, and if we, we still have to do everything virtually another year or two, I don't know. I might just go insane. But before that happens, I might just need to take a break, a long extended break to keep my sanity intact. Gosh. So I can't wait until I receive my vaccine. I hear that most of you have received yours. That's great. I'm on the waiting list. The end is near. I see the light at the end of the tunnel. So we will be back together soon, seeing each other face to face in person, shaking hands and hugging each other all the time and all that rough physical stuff, yeah. I can't wait. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the... So, our scripture text for today is from the Gospel of Luke. The reason Jesus appears before his disciples and said, Hey guys, peace. And then his disciples were like, what? Is it really you? Is it really you? And Jesus said, yeah, it's me in person. I know it's hard to believe, but it's me. You can see me now. You can hear me. And yes, you can even touch me. Yes, touch me. Touch me. High five. High five. Yes, James. High five. Yes, John. High five. Yes, Mary. High five. Yes, Peter. Stop staring me as if you've seen a ghost. Touch me, Peter. High five, Peter. The reason Jesus appeared to the disciples and told them to touch him. Now, in John's Gospel, we read that Thomas was not there when Jesus first appeared to disciples. He was nowhere to be seen, missing in action. Now, we're not sure where Thomas was, but that's not really important. So, when he came back, his friends told him that the reason Jesus was right there just a minute ago. And he was like, you guys are all kidding me. You're seeing things. But when he found out that they were not joking, but being, being very serious, he was like, I, I don't believe you guys. Your, your words, unless I see him and touch his hands. So Jesus appeared for the second time and faced Thomas and said, I'm here, Thomas, not virtual, but in person. And here are my hands and feet. Touch me there, Thomas. High five, Thomas. And Thomas got all freaked out and said, Oh my God, it's indeed you. And he believed. The reason Jesus appeared to disciples and greeted them with peace be with you. And the next thing he said was, touch me. And he specifically told them to touch his scarred hands and feet where the nails went through and his side where the spear pierced. He told them to touch his wounded marks. Touch my hands and feet and my side. Now, 
We hear some of our war veterans sometimes proudly talking about their experiences in battles and showing the injuries they sustained in the fighting so-called badge of honor, the battle scars. Yeah, you see this? This scar is from the injury I sustained during Operation 101. I rushed towards the hill where the enemies were camped and a bullet hit me right there. You see, if it went any closer, like even a point zero 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 one inch closer, I would be dead right there and then. Yeah, I was lucky. See the scar? Yeah. And then we all say, wow, marvel at the battle scar, a badge of honor. Now you can imagine Jesus showing his scarred hands and feet to disciples and telling them, yeah, you see these scar marks in my hands and feet? Yeah, that, that's, that's where the nails went through. Yeah, that hurt a lot. Yeah, I hung on the cross like that for hours and the stretch marks and all, yeah, really terrible. And the spear mark on the side, yeah, well, by that time, I didn't even feel anything, totally out. That's when I breathed my last. Jesus showed his wounded hands and feet, sort of his badge of honor, and told his disciples to touch them. Touch the wounded hands and feet and the pierced side. Now, I wonder about these wounded marks. Why did the wound still remain? If Jesus received the resurrected body, shouldn't his body be without any trace of scars, any form of brokenness? He would have had a perfectly new body, a transformed, resurrected body, an immortal body without any hint of scars. But the scars still remain. The wounded mark still visible, and he even told the disciples to touch the very spot where he was wounded. Why? And what's the point of Jesus showing his wounded hands and feet, and even told them to touch them, other than Thomas insisting that he sees and touches them? Well, maybe Jesus wanted to prove his resurrection. Perhaps he wanted to show them a physical proof he was physically present, even shared meals with them to prove that he was really alive and well. Or maybe he wanted to brag about his badge of honor. You see, today's text from Luke's gospel, we can see that Luke is very logical and somewhat institutionally biased in his narrative. We read that after showing his wounds, Jesus reconfirmed what the scripture had pointed out. He helped them to read the scripture as to say that, yes, it's in the Bible, you guys. And when they read the scripture, Luke said their eyes were open. Now, this is similar to the account where two disciples met the reason Jesus on the road to Emmaus. They did not recognize a traveling companion at the beginning that was their Lord. But when he opened their scripture and broke the bread, their eyes were open. They realized then that he was the reason Jesus. See, Luke's account is very logical, predictable, and formal in how he narrated now, the account in John's gospel is much more personal in nature and depth. John's narrative confronts us on a personal level, challenging us to personally respond to the event. It asks for deeper faith response, addressing both the first disciples and all other disciples who would follow the reason Jesus afterward, even to us. Jesus said in John's narrative, you would be blessed if you believe without seeing. But the question still remains, why would the reason Jesus show his wounded marks and even told them to touch the wounds. Well, I think it's a reminder of the cost of resurrection. What it costs to bring new life, to bring peace. The reason Jesus came to disciples and to us with this, peace be with you. Jesus is the peacemaker, the prince of peace. As the reason Jesus comes to us with peace, we go out into the world with peace. We are the peacemakers. And how do we bring peace and make peace? Well, 
Jesus reminds us that it cost his life to bring peace. It cost him to suffer the pain of nails and the spear to pierce his body. His scars remind us that peacemaking cost us. It cost us to suffer. It cost us to offer all, even our life. The scars are not just a badge of honor, but the reminder that to follow the reason Christ, we must be willing to receive the blows for the sake of peace like Jesus did. It's a reminder that without Good Friday, there is no Easter. Without suffering, there's no hope. Without death, there's no life. Without cross, there's no resurrection. We follow the reason Jesus as we carry our cross. It's a paradoxical image, isn't it? But discipleship is paradoxical in nature. We are the Easter people, but we carry the cross. We walk the path of cross. We have been saved, but we still have our shortcomings. We have been forgiven, but still struggle with our sins. We have received an eternal life, but still live in a mortal body, still subject to temptations and death. Remember the reason Christ healed us whole, gave us a life eternal, but we still carry the wounds, our weaknesses. And as long as we live on this earth, we will not escape this mortal body, mortal being with all the shortcomings and weaknesses and sins. We are Easter people, but the wounds still remain, still visible. And this is how we go out into the world as Easter people. We go out into the world showing the world our wounds, our weakness, our shortcomings, our brokenness, and even our sins, yes. Not as badge of honor, but as who we are. Our call to ministry is not about going out there and trying to change people from bad to good, trying to convert people to Christianity. No, we are called to show the world how we are willing to carry our cross, how we are not afraid to share with people our brokenness, our wounds, our mistakes, our weaknesses, and our vulnerabilities. How we are struggling every day, just like everyone else. How we are making mistakes, just like them. How we are not all well-kept, well-managed, well-groomed, and well-under control, just like everyone else. We show the world our wounds and even let the world to touch our wounds. Of course, ultimately, we also share with them that we follow the risen Jesus who has conquered the death, who has overcome the evil, who is our hope and savior, who has given us new life, a new second chance, a new day. But we first make our wounds and brokenness visible to the world and even let the world to touch them. You see, we are all wounded inside, whoever you are. I found that what really brings hope and brings healing and support is this sharing of our weaknesses. Not hiding, but sharing. When the community and friends are able to share their brokenness with each other, then the healing flows. We are strong in our weaknesses when we are not afraid to share them with each other. I've experienced them over and over again in this power of cross, power in the cross, power of sharing our pain and suffering and brokenness. I experienced, I've seen, witnessed over and over again in my ministry, in my life. People have found support and healing when they make their wounds visible, when there is a safe place, space to bear their brokenness to others in the circle of friends. I've seen healing and reconciliation occurring during my ministry of the First Nations people in their church, in their healing circles, when they are not afraid to share their pains, their sufferings, their brokenness. The most personal and most universal that we all share is this human suffering, human shortcomings, human brokenness, and human sinfulness. When the church is able to share their shortcomings, their woundedness to the world, then there is a 
power, power to heal, power to make peace and reconciliation. There is a power in the cross, power in the sharing of our wounds. We are called to share our wounds. Now, it's hard to do, but we are able to do that because the reason Jesus touched us first. He has already touched our wounds and made us whole. And as touched and healed by the reason, Jesus, we go out into the world and show our wounds and let the world touch us and let the world to see the broken body of the risen Christ and let the world to touch his wounded hands and feet, touching his pierced side. Touch him. Touch him.